I could see it. Hi, everybody. Just to see you all. How'd you get up here, Craig? <laughs> Inner sanctum, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Dave. Where do you want me? Over there. Mr. President, are you confident that the Allied leader's reaction to the what I'm here to discuss with uh, my friend of long standing, and uh, I'll be in a better position to answer that when we have our press conference. I will not tell you a secret. I think yes. Thank <laughs> <laughs> I have a statement and then I'll be glad to respond to your questions. This year the people of the East made fundamental choices about their destiny and governments there began to honor the citizens' right to choose. What these changes amount to is nothing less than a peaceful revolution. And the task before us, therefore, is to consolidate the fruits of this peaceful revolution and provide the architecture for continued peaceful change to end the division of Europe and of Germany to make Europe whole and free. Great choices are being made. Uh, greater opportunities beckon. The political strategy for NATO that we agreed upon last May makes the promotion of greater freedom in the East a basic element of alliance policy. Accordingly, NATO should promote human rights, democracy, and reform within Eastern countries as the best means of encouraging reconciliation among the countries of Eastern and Western Europe. Although this is a time of great hope, and it is, uh, we must not blur the distinction uh, between promising expectations and present realities. We must remain constant with NATO's traditional security mission. I pledge today that the United States will maintain significant military forces in Europe as long as our allies desire our presence as part of a common defense effort. The U.S. will remain a European power, and that means that the United States will stay engaged in the future of Europe and in our common defense. Many of the values that should guide Europe's future are described in the final act of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. These values encompass the freedom of people to choose their destiny under a rule of law with rulers who are democratically accountable. I think we can look to the CSCE to play a greater role in the future of Europe. The 35 nations of the CSCE bridge both the division of Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. 
It's a structure that should be able to contribute much to the future architecture of Europe. I also appreciate the vital role that the EC must play in the new Europe. And it's my belief that the events of our times call both for a continued, perhaps even intensified effort of the 12 to integrate and a role for the EC as a magnet that draws the forces of reform toward Eastern Europe. And that's why I was exceptionally pleased that we agreed at the Paris Economic Summit on a specific role for the EC in that group of 24 effort to assist Poland and, and Hungary. We stand on the threshold of a new era, and we know that we are contributing to a process of history driven by the peoples determined to be free. The people of Europe, especially the brave citizens of the East, are illuminating the future, and yet the outcome is not predestined. It depends on our continued strength and our solidarity as an alliance. Our transatlantic partnership can create the architecture of a new Europe and a new Atlanticism, where self-determination and individual freedom everywhere replace coercion and tyranny, where economic li liberty everywhere uh, replaces economic controls and stagnation, and where lasting peace is reinforced everywhere by common respect for the rights of man. I now would be glad to respond to some questions, and we got to be out of here in about a uh, little uh, after quarter of. President, I have a two-part question. You've made it clear that you are going to stay in Europe, but in view of the dramatic reductions in tensions and the obvious weakening of the Warsaw Pact, what will be the real American role? And two, will there now be more money for the poor, the homeless, public housing, the nation's really uh, badly in need to repair of infrastructure? We have a lot of demands at home, uh, and there's no question about that. But I think it is premature to speak, as some are at home, about a peace dividend. Take a lot of money out of defense and put it into other worthy causes. And so I, I, as I've started over the budget figures for uh, the next, bu next budget cycle, uh, we are under a tremendous burden to get our total spending down in order to meet the Graham-Rudman and the Graham-Rudman targets. In terms of the U.S. role, I think I set it out here pretty well. We will continue to play a very active role in NATO. I see nothing that diminishes uh, the importance of the United States, and I might, might say that I gathered from our uh, uh, interlocutors there, the other heads of state and government, that uh, they want us fully involved. And I, I, thinking back on my talk with Mr. Gorbachev, uh, I don't see any conflict there either. President right. Vernon Walters, your trust advisor and the ambassador to Bonn, says that he envisions a, uh, says that Germany, East and West, will be reunited within five years. Do you think that's possible, and what would be the implications for NATO and the Warsaw Pact? Uh, I am not um, into the predicting of time on the question of uh, Germany. Let me just, I, I don't know whether the Secretary General read you these points. Let me just read the f four points that represent the U.S. Uh, position on reunification. Uh, Self-determination must be pursued without prejudice to its outcome, and we should not, this, not at this time endorse any uh, particular vision. Secondly, unification should occur in the context of Germany's continued commitment to NATO, an increasingly integrated European community, and with due regard for the legal role and responsibilities of the Allied powers. Third, in the interest of general European stability, moves toward unification must be peaceful, gradual and part of a step-by-step -step basis. And uh, these were, and lastly, on the question of borders, we should reiterate our support for the principles of the Helsinki Final Act. So I am not uh, trying to accelerate that process. I don't think our allies are. I think uh, Ch uh, Chancellor Coles feel com feels comfortable with the uh, four points I have just read. And so I think it's better to uh, let things move on their own and uh, r without the United States certainly setting some kind of deadline. Mr. President, uh, you said in announcing your meeting with uh, Chairman Gorbachev that one of the main reasons was that you wanted to make sure that in this time of change you didn't miss anything. In your two days of meetings, 
Did you learn anything that you fear or feel that you might have missed had you not had it? Uh, yes. What I would have missed is I wouldn't see quite as clearly his priorities. I see him more clearly because he and I sat down and talked. We had about eight hours of talk, uh, some private, and I feel I can sense much more clearly the things he feels more strongly about. Uh, and uh, we had a good chance to point out to him some of the difficulties with our relationship. It wasn't all sweetness and light. I had a very, uh, very uh, good opportunity to tell him how we view the, our, uh, the problems in our own hemisphere, uh, sending of arms in there to uh, help the FMLN and uh, the role that, unhelpful role that Cuba is playing. I recited in detail the, the uh, uh, Oscar Arias phone call to me, please raise with Mr. Gorbachev the unhelpful rule, the destructive role of, of Cuba. So I think it's, uh, I think it's more uh, emphasis, although we did put forward uh, some general themes on the economy, and I think he was pleased, because I think from his standpoint, and this is important for mine, uh, he now sees that we want to have a cooperative, forward-leaning relationship with the Soviet Union. Well, Mr. Mr. President, you have um, perhaps more than any contemporary American president uh, exercised personal diplomacy, uh, establishing personal friendships with a wide variety of leaders. Are you prepared now to say that Mr. Gorbachev is your friend? I'll say this. We had a very friendly conversations, and then once in a while there were uh, a little tension there. But uh, it was extraordinarily friendly in the, in the conversation aspect. I don't know how you uh, go further than that in definition, but uh, I'm convinced that he is determined to do that's what, that what he told me he's doing, uh, reform, uh, perestroika, openness we totally agree on is a, is a democratic value. So, Britt, what happened was I think he took my measure and I took his, and I think we just feel uh, more comfortable about our common objectives. Yeah, John. Yes, sir. To go back to what Helen asked you about, you said that we would remain an, an Atlantic power. Keep talking. I'm going to get some water. Okay. After, after World War II, the Europeans needed our money with the Marshall Plan, and they needed our, our military backing because of the Soviet threat. But now, if the Soviet military threat does recede, and I know it's early days yet, maybe this is a question that one of your successors will have to deal with, eventually, what, do they, what are they going to need from us? What role do we really have to play here? We don't live in this continent. Well, we have a tremendous interaction. If you, if you want to hypothetically project to that, that, uh, that guaranteed peaceful time, I would say interaction with the United States on student exchanges, cultural exchanges, uh, economic matters. I mean, there's a tremendous potential for a Soviet Union that, that, uh, that is in accord with us on these democratic values. It's a tremendous uh, market, for example, but it needs the economic reform. So what we've got to do is be sure that we conduct ourselves in such a way that the changes, the political reforms, can keep going forward there in, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, that they can, that uh, the Soviet Union can do what Mr. Gorbachev is trying to do internally, and then there's just enormous potential for living at peace with uh, that tremendous power. Sir, maybe I, I misstated my question. What I really mean is, what, why do the West Europeans need us once the military threat recedes? The, the West Europeans, why would there have to be a NATO? This is a political and military alliance, and truly really only political alliance because of the military need. You mean, whether, why will there always have to be a U.S. presence? And why will there always have to be a NATO? Well, I'm not sure, I'm, if you want to project out 100 years or no, take, some, uh, take some years off of that, uh, you can look to a utopian day when there, when there might not be. But as I pointed out to them, that day it hasn't arrived, and they agree with me. And so the United States must stay involved. What we don't want to do is send the signal of decoupling, the decoupling of the United States and Canada from NATO, particularly at this highly sensitive time. And Mr. Gorbachev understood that. He made that point to me. Yes. Did uh, President Gorbachev ask your forbearance in case he had decided to crack down on dissidents? And if so, what did you say? Or what role did uh, the question of ethnic and uh, Baltic uh, descent have in, uh, in your meeting? The answer to the first part is no. And the answer to the second part is I asked him to describe for me uh, the problems inside 
uh, the, uh, the nationality problems inside the Soviet Union, and he did it uh, in considerable detail. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, you had mentioned that uh, the, uh, you got some insights into President Gorbachev at this point. I wonder if the insights included any sense of his internal position. Did he behave as if a, a man operating from a strong position, a man who seemed to be in, in jeopardy, or, or how do you assess that? I thought he seemed very uh, uh, much in control. Uh, you could tell the way the, he interacted with uh, his own top people there, and um, he felt very confident in discussing without notes a wide array of subjects with me. Uh, he did have a little notebook that he referred to. It was written in his own uh, handwriting, the best I could see, and, uh, and uh, once having seen it, I couldn't read it. And, uh, and so he, he seemed... Uh, in control, he seemed uh, subdued is the wrong word, but I would say determined and and uh, unemotional about it. The most emotion we saw was at that uh, press conference yesterday, but it was a it was a wonderful presentation, and the climate for the leave out the weather. The climate for the discussions was was really good. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. President, as, again, as part of these insights you gained, what is your understanding about Secretary General Gorbachev's view of unification of Germany? Do you think he's as opposed as he said in public, or do you think that he accepts the fact that it's a I think his view was, was one of, uh, if I could use a word that's unfamiliar to many, caution. And uh, I, I really believe that. I think he, he recognizes the rapidity of change. He is very constructively talked about peaceful change. And I, I don't, I think his hope is that people don't try to set up some artificial calendar uh, by which, t date by which that uh, reunification uh, should happen. And I think he's, he feels that, that if there were outside forces, um, setting dates on something of like that, that would complicate uh, the way in which he is managing the change and helping manage the change uh, in the pact. Yeah. Two, Charles, and then. Mr. President, there was a lot of speculation going in that you and Mr. Gorbachev might get involved in talking about deeper cuts, particularly in, uh, in European forces. Uh, did you, in fact, do that, and, and is there skepticism within uh, this organization here about moving too rapidly beyond what has now been dubbed CFE-1? No, uh, we didn't get into that. Uh, we talked very broadly about our aspirations for further arms control, but there was no, no uh, emphasis on that. And I'd, I'd, there may be some strains uh, in one country or another viewing, viewing the rapidity of change differently than we do. But what I suggested to our NATO f allies is let's go forward with the agreements we've got out there, the CFE. Let's get it done. I, the President of the United States, will kick our bureaucracy and push it as fast as I possibly can. I've talked to General Galvin. I had a meeting with him over here last night. Uh, and I'm convinced that we, I must do more to keep it on, on, on schedule. And I've encouraged the other allies to do the same. I don't think there was any uh, resistance to that. Similarly, START and chemical weapons. So before we go into a wide array of other questions, I think the best thing to do is take advantage of the moment and move forward in those three areas. And I, we went, I went over that in, in little talks with individuals from NATO as well as in the meeting itself. Do you, accept, do you accept the principle of a CFE-2? Well, I'd like to get a CFE-1 in the bank first, get it locked up, get those troops out, move down to equal levels, U.S. and Soviet forces. And so we ought to, we ought to manage that before we start the architecture of something else. I want to see that done on time. Leslie. Mr. President, on Eastern Germany, on East Germany, as you know, uh, the party structure, the Communist Party structure has collapsed there. Uh, it's unclear who's running the government. I wonder if you talked about that, if you personally think that it's a dangerous situation, if that moves unification up in the timetable at all. And secondly, what Gorbachev said to you when you said to him unification of Germany would have to be in the NATO context. Uh, no, I don't think it's a dangerous situation. 
I don't think anybody here in this room, including myself, has been able to predict the rapidity of the change, the totality of the change, but uh, I don't see it as dangerous as long as uh, uh, the Soviet leader and the, and the Germans uh, and the West conduct themselves the way I've been, uh, been urging. What was the second part? Um, well, what Mr. Gorbachev said to you when you said unification but only in the NATO <coughs> context, uh, he keeps saying it has to be in the Warsaw Pact context. No, well, we, 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 we were, um, uh, I, I don't think we went into that uh, in real depth, Leslie. Think of that. I mean, obviously well, that's too hypothetical. I got trouble figuring it out on our side with all our experts, rather than knowing what I think he might think about something he hadn't thought about. Maybe, yeah, Tom. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, you seem to have traveled some distance between what you were saying about Mr. Gorbachev a year or so ago and some of the things you said yesterday. Could you please talk in a little bit more detail about the evolution in your thinking that you mentioned yesterday, how that happened and what persuaded you along the way? As I watch the way in which Mr. Gorbachev has handled the changes in Eastern Europe, it, it deserves new thinking. It absolutely mandates new thinking. And when I see his willingness to give support to a CFE agreement that calls for him to disproportionately reduce his forces, and that that is there on the table. Uh, I think that mandates new thinking. When I hear him talk about uh, peaceful change and the right of countries to choose, countries in the, in the Warsaw Pact to choose, that deserves new thinking. And so I approach this, uh, and I think in step with our allies, with a certain uh, respect for what he's doing, and thus, we want to try to meet him on some of the areas where he needs help. I'm thinking of a few suggestions I had in the economic area. But uh, I also believe that, uh, that the West must remain strong and together and uh, try to be helpful where we can in a united way, but not, not, be, uh, not be imprudent. Yes, ma'am. Mr. President, uh, you mentioned earlier that there was some tension during the meetings, and, and uh, earlier to reporters you had said that there was no personal rancor. Could you outline the uh, moments of tension or tell us a little bit, a bit about uh, the moments when you felt there was tension between you and uh, the Soviet leader? Well, I, I think wh where, where you don't have agreement, you can have some, some, uh, uh, some slight tension might result. I don't want to imply there was great dramatic moments of tension. Please, if I, I'd let me clarify it if that's the impression I left. But we have a big difference on how we look at Central America. And uh, I would like to see him use his influence with Mr. Castro, and if he's got any left with Mr. Ortega, uh, to, uh, to facilitate democratic change in the Western Hemisphere. And I make clear this isn't just the view of the President of the United States. But uh, it's the view of many Americans, and it's the view of Oscar Arias. So when you get into a subject like that, where he uh, may have a different, different formula, uh, it's, it's a little more, uh, more um, concentrated than, uh, than when you're clicking off agreements in some areas. Is there anybody here from a, uh, that is not accredited to the White House only because I don't want to be rude to the foreign journalists. You're not a foreign journalist. <laughs> no, well, who? You are, yeah. I, I, was, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to him. Go ahead. Please. Could I ask you um, to elaborate a little more on what you mean by European community integration, greater European community integration? You know what? Um, you, you, made, you made a statement before in your statement. You referred to European community, EC, greater EC integration. Well, what I'm talking about is primarily on the economic side. You're going to have enormous interchange between the East and West. And what we're trying to do in the West, and, and I think the EC is trying to do it also, is to assist those countries that are moving down the, down the democratic path. The EC was charged out of our G7 meeting in Paris to move forward on a, 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 a coordinated economic approach to help uh, Hungary and, and Poland. And so it's in that area where I see the earliest and the most productive uh, integration. Way in the back on the aisle. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. President, at the last two weeks of June, Mr. Gorbachev will be in the USA for the summit. 
the very beginning of July, the G7 will be meeting in Houston. Now, you said in Malta that uh, you wanted to help steward or to help steer Mr. the Soviet Union into the global economy. Is there a prospect that Mr. Gorbachev might stay on for the G7 summit? Or is there a prospect at all of that summit widening to include some of the Eastern powers? The answer is I don't think so. Put it this way, two chances, slim and none. For that, uh, for that particular meeting, uh, nor did he request to be included in that particular meeting. But we're in times of rapid change, and we'll see how things move forward in terms of having a common subject to discuss. You see, we've got to, got to understand his dilemma. They have not had a market, a market economy. They have not had the privatization that, is, that joins the G7 together. It's different. And so what I have proposed, and as, as opposed to the suggestion, the question you ask, uh, is that we work with them and observer status in the GATT eventually, as soon as the Uruguay round is over. Do more for him to do more with OECD. It is important that not just the Soviet Union, but other countries in Eastern Europe understand the market economies, understand the dynamism of the economic systems that join those seven countries. So I don't think it's likely that that, uh, you know, that he would uh, hang around Houston waiting for the next meeting. Yeah, Robbie. Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, you stepped aside on a question about the peace dividend and said that you've got a terrible Graham Rudman problem next year. As you look at the changes in Europe and the possibilities of further defense cuts, do you expect any time in your first term to have a dividend, a peace dividend, to apply to some of the uh, economic and, and social problems at home? And when would you expect that? Um, that's an awful tough question to answer about any time. Uh, I would think it would be extraordinarily difficult uh, because of the, of the, not only the enormity of the Graham Rudman, the difficulty of reaching the Graham Rudman target this year, but uh, what follows on. And so what we are trying to do is emphasize uh, the areas where we can be of most help to the people uh, through various programs. Uh, and I, in some areas, I don't know whether Helen mentioned in her question, education, but in some areas it isn't necessarily a, uh, 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 the problem isn't going to be solved by putting more money into it. But on your question, uh, as we go on down on, the, on meeting these Graham Rudman targets, there just isn't a lot of, quote, excess money, unquote, floating around there. Well, look at the Graham Rudman targets that face us. I don't want to hold out uh, to those that want to rush out and, and uh, spend a lot more money uh, the hope that that is going to happen. We've got some tremendous uh, economic problems that have to be solved because the best answer to helping people, if you have to divide it, I have to quantify it, the best is to have a job. And the best way to have, have the climate for a job is to have a sound economy. And to our foreign friends here, I'd say one of the things that uh, would be the best uh, guarantee of that would be to get our federal deficits down. It would also help us with investment. And that is the best poverty program, a job in the private sector. And so I can't, I don't, want, I had a letter from a distinguished senator before I left because he had read about possible defense cuts, a reduction in the defense budget saying take that money and spend it for a cause that he felt was very worthy. And I, I had to write him back and say, look, that isn't the way it's going to work. That isn't the way it's going to work. Yeah. President, uh, you spoke in your opening statement about the need for a greater role for the 35-nation group known as CSCE. Uh, you know that in uh, Rome, uh, Chairman Gorbachev uh, raised the possibility of a new conference, uh, Congress of Europe, I understand that didn't come up in Malta. No, it didn't. It did? No, it did not. You're right. But even though it didn't, it's an important suggestion, and I wonder how you feel about it. Well, it, I feel about it that I have, a, with respect to him,